Welcome in this session where we are going to talk about how to build observable applications with open telemetry. My name is Danilo and I'm part of the developer relations team in AWS. And I'm Marcia Vishalva, part of the serverless team also in the developer relations. So today we'll start by defining what is complex and what is not and how complexity is affecting the way we put our application in production, and then puts us into this requirement of having observability. And observability has been something that we talk about a lot in the last years, but there's a very interesting global standard, an open standard that is helping create uh, a way to build things only once, and that's open telemetry. So we'll look into that and how that works, and we'll see the AWS distribution for uh, uh, open telemetry that, that is an upstream distribution that we have that helps you start with all the adapter for the AWS services that you already use. And then we'll have uh, a quite long demo, so I hope the demo gods will help us today, uh, and we will see uh, how an application can be instrumented automatically or manually, and what that means when we deploy that in different uh, computing environment on AWS, and what we can get as metric and tracing. In the last 20 years, we've seen many uh, companies take their large monolithic application and decompose them in smaller components that we can call services or microservices. And the reason why this happened is not because we are not good developers and we cannot work with large uh, code bases. I think that's really f because it's the way our universe works. In fact, in the last 20 years, uh, also complexity has been redefined as a science. We often use the word complex, but what does complex mean? Complexity theory tells us that if even if you have simple elements, if there are strong uh, dependencies between these elements, you can have the emergence of an unexpected behavior. Think of insects like ants. If you look at an ant, it moves randomly. Uh, it seems something that is very basic. But if you put many ants together, they can find food hidden somewhere and bring it back to their nest. And this is a collective uh, behavior that emerges from this simple interaction between the ants. And uh, in a way, that's similar to what happens with software. When you have a large code base, what happens is that over time, you start to connect one part of your code base to another, to another, and then when you update and add a new feature, you have an unexpected behavior in another part, you fix that, and then you have an unexpected behavior that's just a fancy name for a bug in another part of your application, and you spend more time fixing bugs instead of developing the new features that you want. To solve that, we can adopt services and microservices, so you decompose your application in components, you create strict and well-defined boundaries between these services, the way they speak, not the bounded context uh, that uh, defines them, and these boundaries, that's the interface of the services, limits the propagation of these dependencies and limits this effect of complexity. And we see the same effect in software, in uh, mathematics, in physics, in natural science, and it's fancy that no, the same thing happens all over these different worlds. And this is quite new, but actually already in the 70s, and I have to say Werner is stole my slide today, uh, there's this person, John Gold, who, who wrote an interesting book about system theory. It's the seminar work around system theory in a way, and that's that something complex uh, always starts simple, and then you can add and add the functionality that you want. You can't start and build something complex from scratch because all these side dependencies will create this unexpected behavior, the emergence of something that you would not plan before. And this is also the way we built AWS. For example, when we launched S3, this is the press release from S3 in 2006 when it was launched. Uh, it's March 14, what we call Pi Day, and we now celebrate almost any year. We said S3 is intentionally built with the minimal feature set. The focus is on simplicity and robustness. And this is the way you should think when you build something new. And of course, things evolve and can gain more uh, features, but if you evolve them and you keep them separated, in compartments, in microservices, then you can 
still continue to add features without having unexpected side effects. And now S3 that started with eight microservices, a bit with more than 200 microservices, and if you look at the documentation of S3, there's quite a lot of capabilities that have been added over the years. So we are adopting a distributed architecture in production because that helps us when we develop the software. But then this is a little bit more complex to manage in production because we have all different components that interact over the network. And how can we solve that? Well, we need to be able to get more information to be able to troubleshoot our application in case of an issue, to understand where the issue is and to solve it as quickly as possible. In a way, we need to build our application to be more observable. Yeah, observability. I like this quote from Berner today, and I will use it all the time. Evolve or die. <laughs> and evolution is part of the complexity of systems, becomes complex, and then they start evolving, and they become more complex and simplify, like Danilo was talking. But how we can, as owners of the software, know what our software is doing? Well, it's not only like looking at a screen. I remember when I started working with a software engineer a million years ago, we had a dashboard, one big screen in our office, and we could see the state of our servers. And if it was red, we will panic. If it was green, we will continue working. Now, I cannot put one dashboard to visualize everything. And the challenges that the software has, because it's so complex, there is so mo many moving parts, there is a synchronicity, all this complexity and all the different elements that are involved and all the different stakeholders that are interested in my software, how, how I know that if it even works and what is to work. So that's when it comes to the observability part. And observability is basically a characteristic of a system that lets you understand the system by having external signals. And these external signals need to be emitted by the system. The basic ones are traces, metrics, and logs. Traces is the end-to-end -end request, so a request come in, it can be any kind of request, and then it goes through multiple services, multiple parts of our complex application, and we can start to understand how the life of this request goes. We can understand bottlenecks, we can understand performance, we can understand the latency, we can have a clear view on how these requests move forward. Then logs is basically, well, in one time we write something. It can be an error, it can be hello world, I don't know, does it work, how many times? But it's something that you write into your application. And then we have metrics that is a numeric value or something that happens in a specific moment of time. I like my watch, and that gives me a lot of metrics. Oh, I just got to my 10,000 steps. That's a metric. It's a specific moment of time, and then you accumulate all these metrics, and then you can uh, create trends, and you can understand how the performance is uh, on average or in the P95, and you can start to understand your application. So these three signals are very different from each other, and they provide different value. But they are not the only ones. These are just the basics. And we say that an application is properly instrumented when we don't need to add more instrumentation to troubleshoot. And I will extend this because troubleshooting is the basics of, a soft, of observability characteristic. We want to go one more step with observability. We want to understand what the system is doing, if, if there are going to be any problems soon, can it scale? how the load is going. There is so many questions that we want to ask our observable, observability system that just to troubleshoot errors is the bare minimum. There is so much more. And I'm a developer, so I always think about what is the developer responsibility. And when it comes to observability, developers are kind of totally responsible of instrumenting their code. It's like observability is a characteristic of your system. Like if it's your system, you're going to make it secure, you're going to make it extensible, you're going to make it uh, maintainable, all these kind of non-functional requirements. Well, observability is one. Because that's, if the system doesn't have these signals, it cannot emit them, and then nobody can create anything and understand how the system is performing or doing or behaving. So it's your responsibility to create traces that make sense, that provide enough information that when you, it goes through the different uh, systems, it takes the right values and attributes and collects them and, and shows you the full picture. 
It's your responsibility to do logs in the right uh, level, like verbose, debug, warning, error, whatever is what you're using. It's your responsibility to do structure logging, because if you don't do that, then it's very hard to search those logs and to analyze them later. It's your responsibility to create metrics, not only the system metrics, but maybe some business metric in distributed systems. They are very handy to understand if your system is behaving. For example, if you have an application that is playing videos, you might want to have an idea how many users are watching videos at this exact time, or if you have an e-commerce, how many customers are doing purchases, or these custom metrics that might help you to understand if your system is doing well in that particular moment. So it's your responsibility to do that, because if you don't instrument the code, nobody will do it for you. When we talk about instrumentation of code, there is many, many ways to do it. If you are in the AWS world, maybe you are familiar with our SDKs, like CloudWatch, and maybe X-Ray to get the traces and analyze that. But in the open source world, we have open telemetry. That is basically an open source framework for instrumenting, generating, collecting, and exporting telemetry data. It's a standard that allows you to instrument your code once and then consume it in as many places as you need. And why you want to consume it in multiple places? Because your system is instrumented and then different people have different questions for your system. And for that, you might need different tools. So one dashboard can be very, very useful for your DevOps engineers. Other dashboard might be very, very useful for your front-end developers or product team. Other dashboard might be very, very interesting for, uh, I don't know, your content people. I don't know. But you have different views of the same information and you showcase it to different people. And it's very, very hard if you have to input 20 different SDKs into your application just to complete all these dashboards. So open telemetry is very, very powerful for that. It's one of the most popular projects in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And this, I think, is the reason, because we all need this data to understand how our systems are behaving. Instrument once, collect, and send to multiple destinations. And you can work with AWS, other cloud providers, third-party services like Datadog, Splunk, many others support open telemetry, uh, and also open source projects. So it also supports 11 different programming languages, and all these programming languages have different level of support, so go and check. I think Java is the most um, well-supported, but if you are using some of the popular uh, languages, you will find a good support for it. And it provides free, uh, four different signals. So we talk already about traces. We talk a lot already about metrics and logs. And you can see there there is something called baggage. And baggage is something that uh, comes within the traces. So a trace, when we talk about a trace in open telemetry, we talk about a trace is composed of spams. When we talk in X-ray, you might have heard about SAC segments. So it's the same. The idea is that a span is what it goes, for example, uh, one method to the end or one service to the end, that's a span. Then you have another span that is uh, the service two, the trip of that request inside server two. And then service three is the trip of that request as a span number three. But you can define whatever segments you want. But let's think that you have three sub-segments, and uh, in the first sub-segment, you have client ID. And in uh, sub-segment number two and sub-segment number three, you don't have that variable. So if you use baggage, that kind of client ID will propagate through all your spans, and then you can understand from your uh, destinations, you can have a dashboard that will tell you, oh, how is the life cycle of this client ID number two? And you can get that with baggage. And then we have the open telemetry protocol. And this is very useful for uh, companies that want to provide SDKs or want to create visualization tools that can consume the open telemetry data. So as developers, you only need to worry about instrumenting your application. So you instrument your application using the open telemetry SDKs. And then in your application, you need to add the collector. The open telemetry collector takes care of receiving all this uh, telemetry data, processing, maybe doing some small filtering, and then exporting it to the different destinations that you define. And the open telemetry collector comes in many forms, 
uh, depending on what is your application. And this is what Danilo is going to show you during the demo. For example, if you're doing a container, it might come as a sidecar. If you're doing a Lambda function, it might come as an extension or it can be an agent. So different ways is this collector implemented and you don't need to implement it yourself. You just download it, you put it into your application and boom, it works. So we like at AWS to work with the open source community. So that's why we have created our own distribution for open telemetry. This is a production ready open source distribution supported by AWS. It's the upstream first distro of this uh, project and it's uh, optimized for AWS infrastructure, and it comes with exporters for the AWS infrastructure, CloudWatch, X-Ray, uh, OpenSearch, Prometheus, and others. So when you start using this uh, distro, you will be super fast integrated into our um, destination, exporter, sorry. It has a public roadmap and you can check it out. Uh, the GitHub repo is there. You can take a picture of that if you're interested. You can see what is coming up. You can do whatever you do with an open source project. So it's there for you. And if you want to get started, I will show you uh, one example, but Danilo will show you a lot more in the demo. And we are going to do, uh, this is a Java application using Docker. So we want to bring the outro instrumentation agent. And what I mean by auto instrumentation, this is an agent that basically just by dropping it in your application will start instrumenting your application. It will create simple spams. Imagine you have Java application that connects to a Dynamo table and does some fetching. So it will create a span of your application and then it will show you the span of connecting to Dynamo and coming back. That comes out of the box. Then if you want more detail, you can, uh, I will show you how to do the, auto, the, the annotations. Also, it comes with some basic metrics that you will get for free. So the only thing you need to do is get the telemetry uh, distro into your Java application, and uh, then you can define your uh, service name. If you want to create a namespace for your metrics, you can, and define in which interval you want to export that telemetry data into the uh, destinations. I was saying that this comes with auto instrumentation, but if you want to create your own spans, then it's just simple as using annotations. And this works very well in languages that support annotation, like this case, Java. So now we can create a sub segment inside the trace that will be just running this method. Basically, my observe method starts and my span uh, will start and it will have, we will be able to see these two attributes, param1 and param2 inside, for example, x-ray. And then when the method finish, we will see that this, the, the spam lasted, I don't know, 100 milliseconds and the parameters were here and this happened. So it's as simple as putting the annotations. So again, you instrument once and you send it to multiple destinations. Here is a list of some of the partners that works with open telemetry, but there is more. And to summary up this part, when you're in the observability world in AWS, you have many options. You can go with whatever works for you. And a lot of these options you can combine together. It's not, as I was saying at the beginning, you will get one option and that's all you need. So you instrument your application with, and you get the telemetry information. And then from there you collect it and you send it up into any of the applications that you need. And you can get it in CloudWatch, but as well you can see it in OpenSearch. So you can have different graphs, different views, different ways to consume the content. So it's not one way. You instrument one and you can see it everywhere. And now put your candles up for the demo gods. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia. <laughs> so when I was thinking about the demo, I went a little bit back and I said, when I when I start programming as a child, I always liked building the guess the number application. It was the, the first way for me to explore a new programming language, a new platform. And it's a very simple application to build. You have an application that generates a random number between one and, one and 100, and then you can interactively guess the number, and it's an application with values too high, is too low, or correct, you won. This is very simple, normally 10, 15 lines of code, but what happens if I want to build a scalable and multi-tenant version of the guess the number application? Well, things already start to be a little bit more complex. And we can build an application like this. 
So we want to build a web application. So we have a user that connects to an internet browser where the front end of the application runs. And this front end will call a back end that runs on some compute layer with some APIs to create a game, to start a new game, to run your guests, and then uh, you can win or not. And you can have, of course, thousands or millions of users playing in, into this interesting game all time. And this compute cannot save the data in memory because you can have uh, multiple uh, computer environments running in parallel for scalability is one of the requirements. Uh, so you need some persistence layer. In this case, we're using a database where we store not the secret number to guess for one of about all the games that can, customers can play at the same time because you can have multiple games at the same time. And then we want to do something if someone wins. So in, for example, we can use a message queue to send a message with the information about the winner so that we can process this message with another system and maybe send an email or send up uh, a gift or something to, to whoever wins this very interesting game. So on AWS, we can build this uh, in different ways. So for the database, for example, we can use DynamoDB. You, you just need to do some very simple uh, insert and look up by key. Uh, uh, for, uh, for the message queue, you can use SQS. It's probably the easiest way to send a message without having to configure uh, anything else. But for the compute, what are the options? And this is where I was thinking you now when I we were creating this content. There are many options. So I tried to focus on a subset, the most uh, easy and maybe serverless way of building this application. So I can run it on a, a runner. I can run it on a, an ECS cluster, maybe using Fargate. I can run it on a Kubernetes cluster, or I can run it on AWS Lambda. What happens with this different scenario? So let's, let's have a look uh, uh, with some of those. I will not cover actually all of them. So let's switch. Okay, so this is the code of the application. Uh, I used Python here. Uh, and Flask as a web framework, but anything that I say applies to almost all of the programming languages and most of the web frameworks are uh, auto-discovered by auto instrumentation as well. So in this case it's Flask. Uh, there's absolutely no open telemetry code now, so this is just a plain application. Uh, I have here the name of my table, the name of my queue. I'm using time to leave in DynamoDB because I assume that after 24 hours, if you didn't win your game, you probably dropped it, so it will be automatically deleted from the table, so it I will not bloat my storage. Uh, the range is one to 100 to, to guess. Uh, and then uh, I use a, a web framework, so normally all web framework work more by defining the routes. So I have the route slash that will uh, send me the web uh, framework. In this case, it's an index file with some JavaScript. And then I have the APIs. So if I call slash game, I create a new game. So as you see, the route is calling an internal function. Uh, if I uh, call, and then I redirect the client to the, uh, link, to the link of the new game. And the link of the, each game is slash game slash the ID of the game. Uh, and if I go into this route, I get the information about the game. It tells me you know, how many attempts already have been tried, uh, uh, if the game is still open or someone already won. Uh, and then I have another route. If I append to this URL uh, a number, this is the guess. This is the number that I want to guess. So get slash game ID slash number, that's my guess. So in this case, I play the game. Uh, I check the game, the number, if it's too big, if it's too low, uh, and I send the result. And if I win, I call another internal function, that is win game, uh, that will uh, manage the, the winning of the game. So this first part are routes, and you will see that uh, uh, auto-instrumentation is quite good in managing routes by itself. But then there's the business logic. In this case, it's relatively simple, but this is where your unique logic that you build for your application will be. So like creating the game, getting the game information, incrementing the number of attempts, uh, and winning the game, where you need to win the game and flag the game as one on the database, and then send the message using SQS. So there are two types of function here, the routes and the internal business logic. 
If I want to use auto instrumentation, I don't need to change anything here. I just need to add uh, to the requirements, so the dependencies of my application in Python, but in another uh, language would be similar. In this case, I add the open telemetry distro, uh, I, uh, specifically for the OTLP protocol, and then I add a couple of extensions that we developed and that you can find for different programming languages that allows you to use uh, AWS services in an easier way, and also that does do some magic with uh, HTTP headers and, and X-Ray to make it work smoothly with open telemetry. Now that I have this application, I decided to put it into a container, so I have a Docker file, and here I start to use our instrumentation. So after I install the requirements, and so the Open Telemetry Toolkit has been installed, I use Open Telemetry Bootstrap to do the auto instrumentation. This will uh, inspect my code and do some uh, monkey patching, so it will automatically replace some function with functions that wrap the original function with some instrumentation that they, it's built automatically by, by, by the framework. And this normally works very well with uh, web frameworks that are already integrated with the platform. So you will see that Flask is recognized automatically. And then I can use some variables to define the name of the service. Uh, and I can use Open Telemetry Instrument to start the Flask uh, application. So it's just uh, a, a way to wrap the application when it starts. So with this Docker file, I created uh, the, 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 the Docker image. And uh, the, the image is used with AppRunner. So if you don't know, AppRunner is a service where you can either connect a GitHub repo, and we manage the full runtime for you, or you can, connect, or you can con use a, a container image, as uh, I'm doing in this case. So there is this, this container image that we saw, and this is the URL. So I know that you're all excited. Let's play the game. So this is the uh, fancy web interface that I built. This is the uh, API endpoint. It is automatically discovered by uh, the original URL of the browser. I can start the game, and this calls the API. It generates a unique game, and I can start playing. So 50 is too small, 75 is too small, 87 is too small, 93 is correct. Well, I've been lucky. <laughs> so if we go into SQS, let's try to poll for messages. And OK, there's some message in the queue. And this is, there is a winner with four attempts. And maybe if you have authentication here, you can put you know, the customer ID or the email for processing this in a more fancy way. Let's delete the message so that the queue will be clean as we go on. Let's see what happens on the observability side. So this is the CloudWatch console. Let's go on the service map. And we see that the service map is building up. This guess the number that you see on top for now, let's not look at it, because, because it's, the health, uh, it's the health check of the same version running on ECS. Since it's on ECS, there's an health check, and that's recognized, so it creates this map. And here, we see the guest, runner, uh, guest number app runner service, this, this one here, below. And the app service is calling DynamoDB and the SQS queue. So it works, I have the full application mapped, uh, and uh, as you may have known, uh, this week, we launched cross-account monitoring for uh, uh, CloudWatch. That means that I can trace applications that go across uh, different accounts and have a single trace that spans different accounts. So it's very flexible. So let's click on SQS here. This gives me you now some statistics and latency of this component. And here I can also see the individual traces that are used to build the overall map. I click here, and I have the list of the traces, and I have only one trace. And this is the trace that goes to SQS. I know that it's the winning trace. It's when I go with the correct number and I go to SQS. So let's check if this works. I click here. And here I have the segments, now the spans, as are called on X-Ray, with all the interactions. So I have the app runner service. It's calling DynamoDB for a get item, a DynamoDB for an update item, and then SQSQS to send the message. So I have automatically instrumented my application. But it's not really clear how my business logic is bound to this operation. So I don't know the, who is doing get item in my code, who is doing put item in my code. It's not really clear. If I go here on metadata, I can see that some of these uh, uh, segments have uh, metadata that is automatically populated by open telemetry. So here I have the, you know, the version of the SDK that has been used for open telemetry. I have information that is reported for the AWS SDK that has this is an AWS API, and this is the DynamoDB table. So it's already populating uh, the fields with a lot of information, uh, and also for, uh, for SQS. But there's no link with the 
uh, with the business side of my application, with the function that implement my, my own business uh, logic. So how can we, do, can we do something better? Of course, yes, otherwise we would have 30 minutes left. Uh, and let's go to a similar application. So this is the same application where I'm adding uh, manual uh, instrumentation. The dependencies are the same. So I use the same open uh, telemetry modules as before, but now I import the modules inside my code. Uh, again, this is Python, but it would be similar in Node.js or, uh, or in Java. And I import, for example, trace, traces and metrics. And then I use this module to create a tracer and a meter. And as the name suggests, I will use this to create traces and, met and metrics. So first, let's create uh, metrics, and I create a few counter. So for example, a game counter that I will increment when there is a new game, uh, a game not found if someone tries to reach a, a path where there is a game ID that is not on the database, uh, how many attempts have been done, and so on. So if I build a dashboard of my application and I want to monitor if the, this, uh, the, the, the player are, are, are okay with my application, maybe looking at the attempt uh, counter that tells me how many games they are playing is the best way to know if my application is working. Maybe the CPU, the memory, the latency tell me a lot about the infrastructure, but the, the attempt counter is telling me that players are happy and they are playing with my platform. If this number drops uh, or maybe skyrocks high because everything is stopped and they start to click for <laughs> multiple times to do an operation, uh, that tells me that it's not working. As, as Marcia said, business metrics are probably the best way to monitor your application. If you are in e-commerce, how many sales per minute, how many products search catalog uh, every minute. Uh, and with this kind of business metrics, you can also use anomaly detection because they normally have a pattern, except maybe Black Friday or Christmas or strange periods. So if they, uh, with, uh, CloudWatch, for example, supports anomaly detection uh, on, on metrics, and they can, it can tell you if there's a high probability that you're getting outside that from the expected range of this business metric based on the last couple of weeks of data. So that's a, a very interesting way of monitoring your application with business metrics. So for now, I just created the metrics. Now if we go below, we have the routes, and don't change nothing in the routes. And then we go to the business function. Uh, the first one is create game. And here, since Python also supports annotation, I start with an annotation. I say to the tracer, start a, a new span here. And for clarity, I use the same name as the function. I call it create game. So inside the operation, there is an, uh, a span that is a unit of work, an operation inside a trace that is called create game. Spans can be embedded inside a span. So you can create a multiple level of span, one intro inside the other, depending on the complexity of your application. Here, I uh, use the counter. And I, uh, since this is the function I create games, I increment the, the, the counter game. And then I, uh, I, I want to add some metadata to, my, to this current span. Uh, for example, you can add uh, the, the customer ID or information like this. So in this case, because I used an, uh, an annotation, I need to ask what is the current span, get it, and then set the attributes like the game ID and the secret number that I'm trying to guess. In this other function, get game, uh, instead of the, uh, of the annotation, I'm using explicitly the, 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 the tracer. So I'm using wit, that is a nice syntax of Python, but the idea is that you can explicitly create a tracer that will return the, a span from the tracer and will return a span object that then you can use to set attributes in this case. And this goes similar in the other way. So if you set the standard, it's relatively easy to instrument your application by adding annotation or a few lines of code to uh, create the span to isolate the part that you can think makes sense to isolate in the, in the, in the visual trace that is going to be generated. So let's go back to, to UpRunner and ask you, ah, in the Docker file is exactly the same, so I didn't change the Docker file at all. So the only change now is the code of the application. Let's go on UpRunner and there is this other service that I created on UpRunner that is using this new image where the only difference is the app.py file. Uh, and of course, when the auto instrumentation starts, we'll auto instrument is a component plus find the instrumentation is already there. I forgot to say before, I enabled uh, tracing and observability uh, for this uh, AppRunner service. And we'll see maybe later how that works. So let's click here and play another exciting game. So 50 is too small, 75 is too small, 87 is too big, 82 too big, 79 
too big, 77, too small. Okay, it's correct. I'm getting worse. Maybe I'm tired for the presentation. Let's poll for messages. We have our wonderful message. There is a winner in seven attempts. Let's delete this message again to keep it everything clean. Let's go on CloudWatch. Let's go back to the service map and let's refresh it. And now we see that the tracing data is going to the collector. Uh, the collector is managed by the AppRunner service and this is sending the data to, to, to X-Ray uh, to, to trace what is happening. And now we have something similar. This one above is, again, the heartbeat of the ECS service, so we can ignore it for now. Then the AppRunner service is calling DynamoDB and SQS. Let's click again on SQS. I can view the traces. And this trace here is the trace that has been generated with manual instrumentation. And as you can see, I have more information now because I have the guess the number service as get game, so the first span that is calling DynamoDB for the get item. I have win game that is calling DynamoDB to update the item, and then SQS. And if I look at the metadata, I have the metadata that I decided to add. So here I have the game ID and the number of attempts. And if I go on win games, again, I have one attempt more because it's when, when I won the game. Now I'm able to link the trace with my business functions. And if something breaks, it's much easier to debug and find where in my code the problem is originating. If we go on uh, uh, ECS, and uh, uh, things are pretty similar. So this is an ECS cluster where I created a service. This is a cluster using Fargate by default. If I click on, uh, uh, on the service, I can look at the configuration. And here we see that this, uh, this service has a load balancer. And then behind the load balancer, there are two tasks. A task is similar to a pod with Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, each task is using the configuration that I pass. And if we look at the configuration, each task has two containers. One is the app. App is the name that I used when I created the app with uh, Python. And then we have the AWS Hotel Collector, that is the sidecar container running in uh, a side of the uh, application container uh, that will receive the information and then with a little bit of buffering and optimization, send it back to the destination that I configure. Uh, when you use ECS, there is a, a, a simplification with the console, a simplified, a simplified experience. So you don't actually need to create the sidecar container. You just enable in the task observability with tracing uh, and maybe monitoring with Prometheus, and it will automatically add the sidecar container for you uh, when you create the task definition. So it's quite convenient. Let's look at uh, at how this is configured. So when you configure this, you can pass, for example, the Prometheus endpoint, and you can pass a, a configuration file that can also be stored in the AWS parameter store. If I go on the parameter store, this is the value, and this is the configuration file, the standard configuration file of the collector, where I define which are the extensions, the receiver, and the exporter. So basically here, I'm saying that I want to export uh, to Prometheus, where I use uh, the AWS uh, managed service for Prometheus. Uh, I use AWS EMF, that's the embedded metric format. It's a nice way to send metrics to AWS, to CloudWatch, uh, and basically what it does is writes on a CloudWatch log using a specific JSON syntax, and then CloudWatch automatically extracts data from the uh, uh, JSON data and will populate a metric for you. Uh, it's the most efficient way to create metric. You shouldn't use put a metric that is an API of CloudWatch yourself, because that's an API that it's, uh, it has a very low throughput, so if you have many applications, you can have problems. But the embedded metric format is the way it, uh, that, that, that you can do it. There is, it's completely transparent for you. You just need to uh, put it here, and, and, and we developed the, uh, the exporter for you uh, for, uh, for open telemetry. For Prometheus, I use the AWS Managed Service. So in this case, for authentication, I use SIGV4 OAT. This is another module that we developed for OpenTelemetry. Uh, this is managing the SIGV4 authentication. SIGV4 is how we authenticate our own API on AWS. Uh, and in this way, you have the authenticator here. So if the, uh, the, the piece of compute where this is running as a, can assume a role that can uh, uh, ask permission to write on to this uh, Prometheus service, SIGV4 will sign it and will be accept and it will work. So this is the configuration, and this means that if I go here, I have my managed Prometheus, 
I have uh, configured also Grafana uh, uh, link to this Prometheus uh, 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 instance. And here I can explore what Prometheus has. So now Grafana is loading the metrics. Let me zoom a little bit. And here I can see the metrics, and there is, for example, the attempt counter. This is the metric that I was creating that has been populated by, by, uh, by the application. So I have my metrics are being sent to two uh, receivers. One is Prometheus, and the other one is CloudWatch. So if I go here and open uh, CloudWatch metrics, we can see the custom metrics here. So the AWS namespaces are the metrics sent by AWS services, and the custom namespaces is what you can create custom. And here I have one that is automatically created with the name of the service, guest and app. And here, I can, if I click, I have the three application metrics, game counter, attempt counter, and one counter that have received some data. And also, you can see I have some automatic metrics created by the automatic instrumentation because it has found that this is Flask, so the web framework is integrated with the auto instrumentation, and the number of active requests and the duration are automatically sent to CloudWatch because I configured the exporter. So this, the two below are automatic instrumentation, and three above are manual instrumentation, and then I can pick, select them, and, 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 and create graph. There's not a lot of data now, so let's not do that. So with ECS, we have something a little bit more. What about Lambda? So with Lambda, I have two options. I can use a container image or a zip file. Uh, with the container image, I can use basically the same image as before. And in the Docker file, I can add, uh, this is the, this is the sum. Okay. And I can add the, uh, uh, the Lambda web adapter that is an open source project that has been created by AWS that will translate the Lambda events to the uh, web application. Uh, we had another session with Marcia focused on this, so if you were not there, maybe you can watch it afterwards. But this is a one line of code that you can add in your Docker file and will translate Lambda events to a web application running in the container, and you can run, put almost any web application uh, in, inside Lambda without uh, further changes. And then I need the collector, but with Lambda I can create a sidecar uh, container. So the collector needs to run inside Lambda, and the easiest way is to use the layer that we provide for Lambda. Uh, and the layer, you can use it also inside a container image uh, with this trick here. So I'm using a multi-stage Docker file. In the first stage, I download the zip file uh, of the layer. I expand the layer. And then in the next stage, I copy that directory into the main image. That is the image that then I pass to Lambda. Uh, this is under slash opt. And the Lambda extension works that under slash opt, if you put an executable file in a specific path, it will be automatically started by the Lambda function, so the collector automatically will start as a process, so an agent inside the Lambda execution environment. You can also do this yourself and use the main open telemetry distribution, but you need to do all these tests by yourself, so using the layer makes things much easier. And I can, again, pass a configuration file if I want to configure my, uh, my, my collector. The other option is to use SAM, and that's the option that I will demo. Uh, and in this case, what I want to do, instead of using the Lambda Web Adapter, uh, there are many uh, tools for different programming languages that do with, with translation in the code. So in this case, I have one, I'm using importing a module that with one line of code here will create a Lambda handler for the web app that will transcribe the uh, handler function of my Lambda function that will translate the web events to Flask, so the web framework, and vice versa. So in this case, it's the only time that I change one line of code, but it runs in Lambda. It's a little bit more efficient than having the overall container image uh, as before. Uh, let's see uh, what happens. So on the requirement configuration, everything is as the same. So let's, in this case, I'm using a function URL to provide a web interface to, to the Lambda function. Uh, and this is it. So if I click here, uh, it starts. But let's try to break things, because otherwise, what's the fun? So let's say that there's a deployment that breaks something. What could be the, the problem? Uh, let's say that this is the policy that it's the role that is used by the role by the permission uh, of the Lambda function. And by mistake, someone uh, adds uh, an R here in the name of the DynamoDB table. So it's wrong. 
uh, and let's see what happens. This is maybe strange, but what can happen, and it happens, is that maybe someone hard codes a region or an account ID in the, uh, in the policy, and, and that works in the test or prepod environment, and then when you go in production, maybe using a different region or a different account, things don't work anymore. So let's see now what, what happens here. We have the function, let's refresh and start a game. Let's see, it's still working. There's normally a little bit of delay when, uh, if, the, if the IAM permission has been cached. Let's see. Ah, uh, good point, good point, save changes. The delay was for me. Okay, number. So now probably, let's refresh. Still takes a little bit of time. A little bit more time because this is a demo. More time than usual, of course. I saved the role, yes. Let's refresh here just to see that I didn't make other mistakes. Okay, and now let's refresh. It doesn't want to, to spring cache for, uh, for eternity. Let's close this and just for... It doesn't want to crash. It's the opposite of usual. Okay, let's die, just do a final test, otherwise we can... No, it doesn't want to refresh. Maybe all the deployments of reInvent are s slowing down the propagation of the policy. This is updated, so you can see it here. Sorry? Ah, you think that... that yeah, I, I, I didn't want to go that route, but let's, let's do that. So let's copy this. Let's start Chrome. I think this would be enough. And then zoom. No, I think it's really a, a caching problem for some reason that Yes, yes, it's the right policy. Yeah, yeah, I didn't zoom too much, but as you can see, there is, I guess, the number in the name of the table. Delete the policy. I, I wanted to do something recoverable. <laughs> uh, but let's try to maybe do another update, because, because uh, add another R, and then we, 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 we can see otherwise this part was not the most important of the demo. Uh, yeah. Maybe re reconfigure the lambda, like uh, change uh, something in the configuration. Let's put a little bit more of, uh, we change the permission. Or just to maybe. No, there, there's nothing more. Let's put like a couple of megabytes more so that the environment needs to be recreated. Ah, oh, strangely enough, as our first attempts, things have been broken. So now the start game doesn't work anymore, as who, 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 who would have expected? So if we go here and we uh, go back to service map, what do we have? Now we have a little bit of time that the data arrives. We see that we will start to see in a minute that DynamoDB starts to have some errors. Of course, uh, now things are, takes a little bit more time also here. And let's update. And then let's go here. Let's refresh. Oh, I start to see something reddish. And we see that the trace is telling us there's something, sorry, is something not working here, and you see this color, dark color here on the side. If I click here and look at the trace, uh, we have the trace, and you can see that there are traces, the response code is now 500. Normally, you, you would have seen the 200 here, but since I tried so much, <laughs> those are in the, in the other window. So let's grab one of those, and now 
since we have manual instrumentation, we can see that in the create game, there is a put item and there is an error, so I can pinpoint in which function there is the call that is creating problem to the other service, could be DynamoDB, but could be also another service. Uh, and in this way, I can, uh, I can uh, uh, find in my code what is the problem, and I can go on, uh, on, uh, on uh, CloudWatch logs, for example. Uh, this normally takes another 10 seconds to, to load, uh, and this is the log, and if I zoom on the error, I can quickly find that there is an access denied exception to the specific boot operation and so on, so I can so immediately find the problem. So, with a little bit of bumpy, bumpy test, we can go back to our slides and see what happens. So we explored now this fourth solution. When we used AppRunner, there's a single container, and we have a managed uh, uh, collector that is focused on tracing with X-Ray. When we used ECS, we could use a sidecar container. So in that case, we have the maximum flexibility of what we configure. We can send tracing, matrix, and as logs are going to be standardized by open telemetry, we can also use that for logs. Uh, EKS, I didn't actually do the demo, uh, but it's very similar to ECS. It's very well integrated Kubernetes with the open telemetry ecosystem. And we have an add-on that allows you to install ADOT, uh, the, our distribution of open telemetry, in a very easy way. With Lambda, we have a single execution environment, so we run the collector as an agent, and the easiest way is to use the uh, layer that we provide. So, what's next? What's next? I think Danilo survived, and he will need a beer after this. <laughs> Definitely. Good job. But yeah, so, what's next? So, we talk about evolution of our software, we talk about complexity, we talk about observability, but most of the things that we, um, we are looking sometimes when we think about telemetry is how our backends are doing. But there is way more things that we need to look for. And questions that we can ask our software. We can ask about our user experience, our users are getting demanding and they have even less patience than ever. We need to provide fast recovery. We want to have ephemeral resources in the serverless world. One uh, screen in your office will not tell you all the big picture. So how you solve that when you have ephemeral compute with uh, containers and with serverless. When we have IoT, now we have, I don't know how many devices connected, sending information into our applications. How we observe that? And then our business wants to go fast to market and wants to not have problems when going to market, no downgrading the performance. So there's different stakeholders and different questions that we can ask our service. It's not only if it's our backend working. So for that we need, as I said at the beginning, different solutions, different dashboards to ask the right questions. So a lot of the things we were seeing today is for the backend, but there is a couple of more services that I want you to introduce, and these are just a few to answer some of these questions that are not related to the performance of our backend application. So for example, this one, CloudWatch RAM, real, uh, real user monitoring, is a great tool for those uh, people that are interested on how their frontends are performing for the end users. So if you are interested in understand how uh, the application is perceived around the world, how is the latency, how many errors they are experiencing, and how they feel. Basically, you just grab a little JavaScript, you put it into your web application in your front end, and then you will start receiving this um, telemetry information, and you can start understanding how your users are perceiving your application. Another use case, we were talking about fast time to market and not breaking things when going fast, is this other service called Amazon CloudWatch evidently, and it's so hard to say evidently, that basically allows you to uh, deploy new features into production in using A-B testing, so you can check, oh, is the feature is performing better than the, what we have before? Is it damaging our latency? Is it uh, 
Well, is it better than what we have? Will it hurt us to take this uh, feature out? And you can understand basically how the feature will perform uh, just by deploying uh, different test scenarios and understanding how, this, um, how these users will consume the data and how they will perceive your application. So these are just two of the multiple different ways that you can basically understand the data and ask the questions to your applications. You are the ones responsible for instrumenting them and sometimes you can use systems like uh, frameworks like Open Telemetry to help you to instrument ones and uh, visi visi have a visibility in different uh, destinations. But sometimes, for example, in the case of RAM, it's a different way of instrumenting your application, but you still need to be conscious of what you're doing. And with that, if you want to find the demo that Danilo showed, uh, you can find the code here. And also we have a workshop that you can follow step by step. And with that, you finish this. <laughs> Thank you. And no, just a couple of takeaways. So we've seen what complex means in the software world, and that complexity brings us to have these distributed architectures that require more observability and more investment on our side. Open Telemetry is a super interesting initiative. Uh, I, I think it's really uh, driving uh, a standard so that we can instrument our application once and then send the information wherever we need. Uh, and we have our own distribution that simplifies the use of open telemetry in, uh, on AWS, and we contribute all our, uh, or, or, or everything that we do upstream, so it's available for all the community. So I think it's really the right time to experiment with these technologies and learn. Thank you. Evolve or die. <laughs> I love that. <laughs>